So as I've indicated, my name is Harriet O'Neill and I'm the Assistant Director for Fine Arts, Humanities and Social Sciences at the BSR. It is my great pleasure to welcome the panellists, our co-organisers and our online audience to the first in the series of four roundtable events which share the general heading Sustainability as Cultural Practice, Verbal and Visual Art, History and the Environmental Humanities. The collective aim being to discuss how the arts, humanities, social and historical sciences can help achieve environmental justice and a sustainable future. As you may have noticed, the BSR has partnered with UCL to develop and develop the roundtables, and I'm particularly grateful to Professor Florian Muskenug, the first academic, of di um, academic director of UCL Cities Partnership Programme, for his enormous contribution um, to this joint project. And in fact, Florian, I can't even imagine it without you, so thank you so much for your energy and determination. The roundtables were stimulated by an invitation from the British Embassy in Italy to contribute to pre-COP activity in Italy as part of the British family bid. And we're delighted that Jill Morris, British ambassador to Italy and non-resident British ambassador to San Marino is able to join us and give some opening remarks. So before um, handing over to her, I'd just like to say that this event has been recorded and online audience, you're welcome to send in your questions using the Q&A function. So thank you so much. And um, over to you, Ambassador. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Harriet. I'm delighted to be here today to open this very exciting uh, debate on how verbal art can drive climate activism. I don't have to tell this audience that this conversation is very timely. Uh, 2021 is a landmark year for climate and the environment. This year, the UK is chairing COP26, so the 26th UN, United Nations Conference on Climate Change. And we are um, working together with Italy, who will be hosting the preparatory conference, uh, the pre-COP in Milan uh, in, in October. And what's more, this year, the UK and Italy were working together um, through our, part, our, our presidencies, the UK presidency of the G7, the Italian presidency of the G20, and we're working together to make sure that we're also leveraging those international fora to really drive for the highest possible level of ambition around um, climate and the environment um, this year. Our goal for COP26, which will take place in Glasgow in November, is that it's the next big moment in which countries come together and we recommit um, and we deepen our, our ambition. The goal, of course, is to successfully limit global temperature rise to well below um, two degrees above pre-industrial levels and to drive forward the efforts to limit it to 1.5. And we mustn't lose sight of that very important um, target. But I've mentioned governments, but of course, this change, this green revolution, green transition is only achievable if we all become part uh, of, of the project. And um, that's why I think one word in particular is important and could guide this discussion today, and that's inclusion. When, when we, when, when we um, started to plan the UK presidency of, the, of COP26, um, we committed to hosting an inclusive COP26. So we're not only working with governments, but we're also engaging with non-state actors around the world um, to, to secure science-based targets, encouraging them to commit to net zero by 2050, join the Race to Zero, a global campaign to rally leadership and support from businesses, from cities, from regions, from investors, from and from academic institutions. So we truly believe that we need the broadest possible coalition if we are going to succeed, as we must succeed, um, in raising our level of ambition and meeting uh, our, our targets. So inclusion is central to uh, our approach to climate change challenge and crisis and our approach to COP26. And we are promoting and delivering um, the Action for Climate Empowerment, the Gender Action Plan, and the local communities and Indigenous peoples platforms, which are all important ways in which we 
bring together all communities um, in this collective uh, in endeavor. And we, in the run-up to COP and at COP, uh, we're making sure that we're providing space for marginalized groups, for experts and activists to express their priorities, their views, and to have their voices heard. And of course, this means giving prominence to the voice of younger generations. Mm -hmm those who will suffer the worst consequences of this, of this um, climate uh, crisis. So I'm delighted that today we're going to hear about how the voices of younger generations can help shape this agenda and drive um, sustainable um, development. So if you're listening to this webinar today, you may be at school or you may be at university or at the beginning of a career or a career path, but wherever you are, whatever stage you're at, you're going to be living in a world that is defined by the actions that we take today. And the right actions require the right words to inspire them and the right language um, to inform and shape the way that we approach um, these issues. So climate change is a crisis. It's also a crisis of the imagination and language um, and verbal art is one way that we can imagine ourselves into a greener, more sustainable, more inclusive and fairer future. So thank you very much indeed for inviting me to open. I'm, I'm honoured and, uh, uh, and I'm looking forward to a very interesting debate. Thank you, Harriet. No, oh, thank you very, very much, um, Ambassador, for um, encapsulating so many of the ideas that um, shaped the four round tables. Um, we'll hear more about pre-industrial levels um, next Friday. Um, so I will probably now introduce uh, Florian Muskenug, who is going to then introduce our first speaker and I'll mute myself. Um, and as I say, if you have any questions, do pop them into the Q&A and we'll be looking at them and asking them on your behalf. So thank you very much, thank you so much. And over to you, Florian. Thank you very much. Welcome everybody. Uh, thank you, Harriet, and uh, thank you, Ambassador Jill Morris for your kind and generous words and for, for finding the, the exactly the uh, right tone to, to express our, our hopes and, and concerns at the beginning of this, this series of meetings. Um, as, as, as has been mentioned, the round table is jointly organized by the British School at Rome and University College London and takes place under the auspices of the British Embassy in Italy and the Italian Ministry for Ecological Transition. It forms part of Italy's All for Climate Italy 2021 pre-COP26 programme, promoting 2021 as the year of climate ambition. The series opens, a, the event uh, opens a series of four round tables called Sustainability as Cultural Practice, Verbal and Visual Art, History and the Environmental Humanities. I'd like to thank my co-organisers, Professor Chris Wickham, Director of the British School at Rome, and Dr. Harriet O'Neill, who you've met. I also wish to thank my UCL colleagues, Professor Susan Collins, who's in the audience, and Professor Andrew Barry, who have been involved with the organization of two of the panels. Let me tell you very briefly about the next three events in our series, which are forthcoming. On the 9th of July, so in exactly one week, we'll be discussing how past societies coped with climate change, and for this, will be joined by John Halden of Princeton University, Georgina Enfield of Liverpool University, and John Sabapati of UCL, coordinated by Chris Wickham, Oxford and British School at Rome. A week later, on the 16th of July, there'll be a discussion on sustainable art practice for a sustainable world with the artists Susan Collins, Leone Contini, Emma Critchley, John Jarrett, Holly Hendry and Anya McCausland. And we will end on the 19th of July with a panel called Translating Climate Change with Emily Apter of New York University, Andrew Barry of UCL, Federico Federici of UCL, Anna Laura Wainwright from Oxford University, Loredana Polezzi at Stony Brook University, who is in the audience and who I thank, and Antonia Wolford of UCL. Our series brings together different initiatives and groups, so I'd like to add a special welcome to the 36 students from UCL and from Sapienza University in Rome who've been preparing for today in the context of a co-curricular 
collaborative seminar hosted by the Department of European, American and Intercultural Studies at Sapienza University. I'd also like to welcome the 47 student participants from 11 universities who are attending this event in the context of the U7 Plus Alliance's 2021 Worldwide Student Forum. We are delighted to have many of you in the audience. Others will need to watch it online in recorded form because of timetable uh, difficulties or sort of uh, time zone difficulties rather. We look forward to your comments and questions. I'm grateful to our speakers who I will introduce in turn in the course of the event. So there are Anthony, uh, unfortunately I should say at this point that Anthony Costello cannot be with us today uh, because uh, uh, he's unwell and we wish him the very best for a speedy recovery. He's being replaced heroically and wonderfully by Bethany Jennings, who are welcome. Then we also have in alphabetical order, Liz Jensen, Sara Marzagora, Arya Matai, Almaz Mudali, Elena Wöckingelbach, Isaiah Odenbau, Bernard Okebe, Charlene Atieno Opio, Harriet O'Neill, who you met, Steve Utenia and Arati Prasad. Many thanks to you all. And many thanks also to those who helped with the preparations. Carlo Guagli at the British Embassy in Rome, Marge Brown at Rudian School Johannesburg, the team at the British School at Rome, Professor Nicola Miller, the director of the UCL Institute of Advanced Studies and her colleagues, Zoe Paskett, John Sabapati and Andrew Barry at UCL Anthropocene, and last but not least, my colleagues in the UCL Global Engagement Office, including Mia Kava Tomoyo, Brian Taylor, and Lucy Crick, who's joining us backstage to help with the Q&A and the practicalities. What we hope to achieve together today is, a, is to create a space for many different voices and perspectives. In order to introduce some of the questions that concern us, I would like to read a few excerpts from a co-authored manifesto that has been written earlier this year by a group of UCL colleagues, myself included, in the context of the ongoing inquiry on the case for the humanities. It's just two short paragraphs, and I'd like to sort of read them out if I may. The arts and humanities address what it is to be human. They address humanity as diverse, complex, and fundamentally ambivalent. They query the human from the position of its least privileged and most vulnerable designations. They enable individual and collective struggles for a more humane and more than human world. They demand that we disentangle ourselves from the legacies and fantasies of mastery and violence. We must strive to open borders between the disciplines we encompass as well as those beyond. The model for our work is not dominance or profit, but illumination. Critical skills practiced by the arts and humanities are neither elitist nor self-regarding, but essential to our planetary existence and survival. In this way, the arts and humanities give hope to a planetary cosmopolitics of worlds lived, imagined, in process, and to come. A couple of practical points. As Harriet has already mentioned, you're welcome to submit questions using the Q&A function. You can do this throughout all sessions. We will also have a general Q&A at the end of the th three sections and after our two respondents have spoken. So we'll have three short, relatively short um, mini panels, uh, Sara Marzagora, followed by Arati Prasad and her team, followed by the team from South Africa, introduced by Beth. Then we'll have our respondents and then we'll open to wider discussion. But if you have specific questions to any of our speakers at any point, please share them and we will, as moderators, present them to our speakers and panelists throughout the discussion. So it's meant to be very interactive. Which takes me to um, our first speaker, who I'm very happy to introduce, who is Sara Marzagora, 
lecturer in comparative literature at King's College London. And Sarah um, holds a PhD in cultural literary and post-colonial studies from SOAS University, and, uh, which she completed in 2016. Uh, after this, she led a large, she co-led a large research project on bottom-up and multilingual approaches to world literature. She's held visiting positions at Northwestern University, Addis Ababa University, Rhodes University, and the City University of New York, and has worked as a senior research fellow at the University of Oxford. Sarah is a literary and intellectual historian of Ethiopia and the Horn of Africa. She's currently completing her book manuscript, which is called The True Meaning of Independence, Ethiopian Intellectuals in a Colonial World, 1901 to 1919. She's edited a special issue of the Journal of African Cultural Studies and is co-edited with Francesca Orsini and Karim Malahir, a special issue of Comparative Studies of South Asia, Africa, and the Middle East, which looks at multilingualism and different forms of literary culture. And she will talk today about oral traditions and resistance in Ethiopia. Thank you very much, Sarah, and over to you. Thank you very much, Florian, and thank you very much, everyone, for having me here. Um, I will uh, try to talk a little bit about my research uh, uh, in Ethiopian literature and especially recent developments uh, in uh, Ethiopian studies with regards uh, to research that try to map the relationship between uh, oral traditions uh, and the environment. So I'll start from uh, a general summary of uh, the state of the field. So what is happening in terms of uh, research on oral literature? Oral traditions uh, have tended to be studied uh, for their anthropological uh, value as opposed to their literary value. So traditionally, scholars uh, have looked at oral traditions uh, as a source of cultural information about uh, that particular culture. This meant that oral traditions have tended to be excluded from literary analysis. Uh, and uh, the other feature of the study of oral traditions is that they've tended to be considered pre-modern um, and uh, um, static generally. So um, nationalists have tended to regard the oral traditions uh, as a repository of cultural authenticity for the nation. So as the past of the nation, as the local roots of national culture. This meant uh, that uh, uh, when oral traditions change, uh, there is generally the tendency to decry the death uh, of that tradition, the death of that cultural authenticity. This view has been uh, criticized by a number of scholars uh, that have instead stressed how oral traditions are a dynamic uh, and fully modern form of expression. Uh, while the general tendency was to consider oral traditions as a somewhat uh, expression of a collective culture, scholars have instead uh, analyzed how individual oral artists have bended and appropriated oral genres for aesthetic purposes. So in the last uh, few decades, uh, there's quite a few scholars uh, that have analyzed the oral traditions, uh, not for their anthropological value, but as literary products. This of course, it doesn't mean that there is no cultural information to be derived from oral traditions, uh, but that uh, finally we're looking at them also from their literary contribution and not only as again, these uh, repositories of cultural authenticity for the nation. I'm going to talk about uh, some of this recent research uh, in uh, Ethiopia, in the specific context of Ethiopia. Now, I've done some research on Ethiopian oral literature, so, but I'm going to talk about the research that has been carried out by other colleagues uh, that, uh, whose research has been really groundbreaking, uh, and I would like to bring it to your attention. So this recent research in various uh, um, oral uh, traditions in Ethiopia has brought to light uh, a number of uh, things uh, that when uh, uh, in the popular imagery about oral traditions, uh, we rarely think about them. The first one is the role of youth in uh, the transmission of oral texts. Now, there is generally the assumption uh, that oral traditions uh, are the preserve of the elders. And when the elders die, oral traditions die with them. So in a lot of contexts, European, African, in a lot of different contexts, there is always uh, the uh, fear that oral traditions are dying out, uh, 
because the youth, because culture has changed very rapidly, because now there is a different uh, uh, educational systems, the youth are going to school clearly, um, and that there is new media, there is the internet, and so the fear is that when the um, generation of the elders that dies, the oral traditions will die with them. But I would like to cite the research that my colleague Tadesse Gelata um, Girata has done in southern Ethiopia. Now he's done some extensive fieldwork among the Guji people of southern Ethiopia and has noticed that oral traditions uh, are not only transmitted from the elders to the youth, but that the youth play a central role in the transmission of uh, orature, of oral poems, of oral songs. Uh, in, diff in uh, several different cases, he observed uh, that elder siblings, uh, for example, taught younger siblings uh, songs, poems, and so on, or that young people who, for example, um, were in the fields together looking after the sheep, for example, um, were singing to one another and teaching one another songs. So the youth seem to play a central role in the transmission of oral traditions, uh, which seems to point at a more optimistic future for these particular traditions. Um, whenever you sing a song to uh, a person that is your peer, you are contributing to the spreading of uh, uh, oral traditions. And it could be oral traditions that you've learned in the family, oral traditions that you've learned from other peers, even oral traditions that you've learned from younger siblings. Uh, if you have younger siblings, probably they have different, uh, um, uh, you know, they belong to different subcultures and maybe they might have different slangs, different vocabularies, different lexicon. And by just spending time with them, uh, this is an act of oral transmission that is actually from a younger generation to an older generation. So the first point of this new research uh, in Ethiopian uh, oral traditions is that the youth play a central role in its transmission. So these traditions are not dying out and the young people are central to uh, perpetuating this verbal creativity. The second point is that far from dying out to new media, such as the internet or writing, uh, oral traditions have instead benefited enormously from these other forms. Now, in uh, the study of African literatures, the tendency is always uh, to trace uh, a genealogical line from oral traditions as something that existed in the past, and then you move on to written literature. So there's always this linear story from the oral to the written. But in fact, once we study oral traditions in relationship to written media, but also, uh, for example, social media, the internet, the recording media, and so on, we see that the relationship is really not that linear. There are many cases in which, for example, something written becomes a song, and then the song is recorded on YouTube, people look at it on YouTube, people record from YouTube, people share files on their phones. So again, it's not from the oral to the written, but all these media are intersecting and creating a form of circulation that is not only oral, not only written, not only um, uh, audio, for example, audio or video, but that in which all of these media contribute and bounce off one another. So for example, uh, when uh, uh, this is a personal anecdote, I was in Addis Ababa, I was in an internet cafe and I was just checking my emails uh, and a woman came into the internet cafe with uh, her children. She logged onto a computer and then on YouTube, she, she searched for the recorded version of uh, a television program from the 1960s in which a very famous Ethiopian actor read aloud some traditional folk tales. And she had to go shopping, so she just left her children in front of the computer listening to the video of this old actor reciting folk tales uh, for the audience of the 1960s, but then through YouTube, also the audience of nowadays. So it's very complex, uh, and it's not a case, again, of oral traditions dying out to new technologies. On the contrary, uh, new technologies can enhance the circulation of oral traditions. Again, Tadesse, my colleague that did research in southern Ethiopia, noticed that some children were singing songs in languages that they didn't understand. So they didn't speak those languages, but they were singing songs in those languages. They were singing in uh, Tigrinya, that's a language that's spoken in northern Ethiopia. And they didn't know the meaning of the words, but they had learned the song uh, uh, through social media. It had circulated on WhatsApp, it was a catchy tune. So again, there is a way in which um, oral traditions and these technologies have enhanced the circulation of uh, songs, poets, poems, and so on.
So there is an adaptability, there is a dynamism of oral traditions. And then finally, I um, want to talk about the relationship with the environment, because the other um, way in which scholars have looked at oral uh, traditions is that they are only able to comment uh, on events uh, that were traditional events, for example, events happening in a village, in a rural area, uh, the oral traditions do not exist in urban environments. Uh, and this is not only the case of the study of oral traditions in uh, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, for example, but there's also this assumption that there's no oral traditions in urban areas in Europe either, or no oral traditions in, uh, in Europe, even in rural areas or for the matter. In fact, uh, this new research has highlighted how we find the oral traditions in all of these contexts uh, that we call modern contexts. So in urban contexts, uh, in uh, you know, skyscrapers in the middle of the city where people uh, sit on cocktails and just look at the, uh, the skyline from, uh, from uh, like a glass terrace uh, on the 31st floor. And it's particularly this point uh, that um, uh, shows us uh, the potential of oral traditions uh, to contribute uh, to, uh, to our understanding of the relationship between men and environment. Again, we have to understand oral traditions as something that's dynamic, as something that speaks to the present in order for us uh, to be able to see the potential that oral traditions have uh, in uh, either teaching us something about our own relationship with the environment and how our subjectivity is co-constituted through our relationship with landscape and place, um, but also on the other hand, uh, um, how we can uh, um, use these oral traditions to produce uh, like, um, the ambassador said at the beginning of this uh, of of the of the event uh, to produce new understandings of who we are in relationship um, to the environment. So this is my final point, and it's precisely this area of research that looks at oral tradition in conjunction with uh, um, the environment and landscape in general. Now, recent research, again, in Ethiopia has looked at uh, uh, oral traditions from the point of view of new disciplines that have become quite prominent within literary studies in the last few decades. And these disciplines are eco-criticism, eco-linguistics, and eco-poetics. Now, these are traditional uh, um, tools of literary criticism, linguistics, poetics, and so on. But these disciplines are militant, so they have a strong political thrust because they aim at making research on verbal arts, whether oral or written, relevant for the struggle against the destruction of ecosystems. So these disciplines aim at encouraging certain behaviors and discouraging certain behaviors. Again, these are disciplines that have this activist uh, like push behind them. And um, the assumption is that we understand uh, uh, not only ourselves, but also our societies and the place where we live through uh, certain cognitive frameworks. And by just changing those cognitive frameworks, we can also change the way in which we think about uh, the relationship between ourselves and uh, nature. For example, by changing this cognitive schema, we can reconceptualize nature not as something to be dominated, to be exploited, but something from which we derive meaning as humans, for example. Um, and the type of research that I've been uh, reading uh, and uh, that my colleagues uh, have been doing uh, regarded specifically oral uh, uh, traditions in the context of development uh, induced uh, displacement. The area in which uh, a lot of this research has uh, taken place is the south of the capital city of Addis Ababa, in which uh, several uh, farmers were evicted from their land to accommodate the growth of the city. So the administrative area of the city has been enlarged to account for uh, rising levels of urbanization. And a lot of the people that um, were farming in the surrounding areas had been evicted for the development of urban infrastructure and uh, uh, for the construction of uh, buildings uh, uh, and so on. So uh, the colleague in particular who's done this research is Dr. Adunia Barquetza at Addis Ababa University, who's really pioneered eco-linguistics uh, in Ethiopia. And uh, um, there are three different things that I have personally learned uh, from reading uh, this research that Adunya has carried out uh, uh, in this particular area south of Addis Ababa. 
First of all, that the, there is a strong relationship between uh, literary inspiration and the environment. So the environment is not only the object of verbal arts, but it's constitutive of verbal, uh, of the of literary inspiration for some of these or, oral uh, poets and singers. There are certain places that are places that are commonly uh, regarded as places where people go and uh, um, derive literary inspiration from the landscape. So there's particular some kind of holy mountains or wells or springs uh, that are thought to be places in which the person can connect with that source of inspiration uh, that is a, both a spiritual act, but also a creative art act, an aesthetic act. So the kind of a, uh, it's, a, it's a way in which um, uh, through merging with nature, through um, being with nature, oral poets um, connect to that almost spiritual source of literary innovation. We have several examples of this in uh, Ethiopia, something that, for example, is more cl is closer to my research, is the fact that for particular genres, oral genres, uh, there's almost a, a requirement uh, that the person composing those oral poems uh, has to do it in solitude, in isolation. They have to go to the woods, they have to go to the forest, uh, and there they will find uh, that source of inspiration to compose that particular uh, genre of oral poems. There were stories of, for example, one of the most celebrated Ethiopian philosophers of the 17th century uh, created uh, this wonderful philosophical system that is considered almost uh, in some ways a precursor to the European enlightenment uh, while uh, spending time in a cave. So there's all these stories of people that have ideas that people that produce creatively through this connection with nature. And once that connection is broken, that source of literary inspiration also goes away. So um, another colleague of mine, uh, Asif Adibeba, calls this, uh, th th this displacement uh, uh, as uh, a source of uh, broken places. He uses this expression broken places for the breaking of this link, uh, of this literary link, this aesthetic link between man and environment. So this is a, some kind of a bleaker view of what the development induced displacement does uh, to oral uh, traditions. At the same time, what has been observed by both Asefa and Adunya, the two colleagues whose research uh, has been really pioneering in this field, they have observed that uh, oral traditions also have the potential to recreate new links, new ways in which people uh, belong to the environment. So new ways in which people can forge their sense of belonging to a new environment after displacement. So there's both this aspect of uh, we are losing out uh, some crucial elements that define uh, the human in connection with nature in the context of, uh, for example, development induced displacement, but also, um, I guess, uh, not only development induced displacement, but also displacement that is caused by uh, climate change and environmental change. But on the flip side, uh, oral traditions have also been able to articulate new forms of resistance against this displacement. So there is a lot of new poems that have been created uh, that have uh, uh, tried to figure out uh, new ways in which people can reconnect uh, after being displaced, uh, to recreate a sense of new belonging, but also to articulate the forms of political protest against uh, that uh, displacement. And so, for example, a lot of these new poems uh, parrot, uh, make fun of, uh, mock the official discourse that development will ultimately be good for everyone in the country. Um, and then, uh, so they twist the official discourse uh, by inserting uh, through sarcasm, uh, the reality um, that is often very painful of displacement uh, for people who are actually the, uh, the targets of this development policy. So again, this is what we can study through ecolinguistics, uh, these different speeches, uh, these different discourses that overlap uh, uh, and uh, the way in which the resistance to the official discourse has been articulated uh, in these particular areas. And finally, the final point that I think emerges from this research uh, is the fact that uh, clearly biodiversity includes also cultural and linguistic diversity. This is something that uh, uh, we should preserve as much as uh, the biological elements uh, 
um, uh, the biological consequences of climate change and environmental change and development induced displacement. So the bottom line of all of this research, uh, and that's the point that I would like to share with you, is that oral traditions, oral literatures are, from a certain point of view, the victims of climate change. We see them uh, uh, partly um, again, with the breaking of this, this uh, link between man and nature, also as a source of literary inspiration. But on the other hand, they can also be powerful tools of resistance. Uh, and I think that this uh, will allow me to transition to the next speaker because a lot of it will be about retrieving these voices and harnessing these voices for social change. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sarah. That was a, a a very um, interesting talk and a great opening. And uh, we look forward to discussing this further with you in, in due course. Um, do start sharing questions and comments in the Q&A if you have specific questions for, for Sarah, don't hold back. And we can, we can keep a record and we can answer them um, after the presentations. Um, thanks again. I'll. Um, I'll now introduce our next uh, mini panel, as I said, uh, which is uh, presents a project um, which took place uh, between Nairobi, uh, London and Kisumu and uh, focuses on providing training and mentoring to citizen journalists, to young people um, in Kisumu, in Kenya, um, the initiative was jointly led by uh, Arati Prasad, who is a researcher in environment and health based at the UCL Institute for Global Health, and Bernard Okabe, a journalist and program coordinator for Community Empowerment and Media Initiative. Uh, we are really happy to have them and also to have some of the, um, the people who, who took part in the project. I'm going to introduce Arati, uh, briefly, and then uh, Arati is going to be in conversation with uh, our other guests and panelists. So just to say that Arati Prasad is a writer, broadcaster and researcher. She holds a PhD in molecular genetics from Imperial College London. She has more recently been specializing in bioarchaeology. Um, she's interested in a wide range of topics and fields, uh, all focusing on the impact of science and technology on people, ideas, health, and the environment. Uh, she works as a senior research fellow, as I said, at the UCL Institute for Global Health, but she's also part of an international team excavating and analyzing ancient DNA from funerary sites in Spain, Rome, and Pompeii. And she's working on a book on the cultural material history uh, of silk, uh, which is going to be called Silk a History in Three Metamorphoses, which is going to be published by William Collins in 2023. Her other award-winning publications include the book Like a Virgin, How Science is Redesigning the Rules of Sex, uh, published in 2012, which was shortlisted for the Salon Transmission Prize, and in the Bone Setter's Waiting Room, Travels Through Indian Medicine, published in 2016, which was the BBC Radio 4 Book of the Week, and which won the BMA Awards in 2017 in the popular medicine category. So as you can see, Arati is a woman of many interests, and we're very grateful to you, Arati, for having um, brought together this group of people, and we look forward to hearing from all of you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Florian. Um, yeah, I, I think of all the things that I do, the project that I'm going to talk to you about, and I'm very happy that my colleagues from Kenya have joined us, is, is the most important. Um, I uh, started working for a project that was funded by the Welcome, Welcome Trust, um, which is called Complex Urban Systems for Sustainability and Health. Um, and we look at the impact of the urban environment on people's health and well-being in six cities around the world. but in Kenya, particularly in a city called Kisumu that's on, on the shores of Lake Victoria, we, I got some additional funding from the Welcome to specifically do public, um, public engagement to enrich the research. And the public engagement has been a really important element because one of the things that's missing often from drafting policy 
government policy on on urban environment planning and change lacks the voices of people and especially the people who are who can be most marginalized from from various social economic groups where a lot of good work is going on but may not go recognized one of the things we realized very early on is that um uh, I met Bernard Akebi in Kisumu, and Bernard, who's, who's going to speak in a moment, he's a journalist himself, and he's a programs coordinator for Community Empowerment and Media Initiative in Kisumu, Kenya. And he also does a variety of things. So he works with farmers, for example. But as a journalist, he's also been working with us to train journalists in, in Kisumu, specifically in skills, to be able to write about environment and health. So um, these are things that journalists may not feel very confident in because there's science involved and they're speaking to researchers and it's about how to put those stories together so that it is a part of public discussion and remains uh, on the government agenda because people's voices are there. So those are journalists that Bernard's been training. And then um, through working with our researchers, uh, who are working on the public engagement project, which is specifically on waste management in informal settlements, because it's it's lacking right now. The government doesn't plan for it in these cities, and it causes a lot of um, both environmental and harm to pe the people's health. Um, we realized that for the sustainability of the project, to make sure that voices can keep, can keep being heard, it's in the hands of the young people who live there, who, who know what's happening there. They, this, is this is the authentic story that's coming from them and their voices must be able to articulate what's happening there and what they want the government to do about it. And that's how we hope that a part of our project, a big part of our project will be, that's how um, change will happen. So I'm very happy, very, very honored to say that uh, we have two of the young trainees from the informal, two different informal settlements in Kenya, and they're training with Bernard and also our uh, partner organization, Science Africa, who, who's based in Nairobi. And they are Charlene Atiano Opio, who's 23 years old, um, and she has a diploma herself in community development and social work. And she lives in the Kondele informal settlement in Kisumu. And also by Steve Otieno, who's 26 years old. And he's from the Manyata settlement. Uh, he recently graduated at, from university as a teacher, but he's not currently working as a teacher. Um, we also have a very special guest, uh, someone I met at the start of the project. And I, I think it's a real honor to work with people I call the real experts in this project. Um, we're working on solid waste management and Isaiah Odiambo, who's 28 years old, is someone who has so impressed me in so many ways with the way he thinks about his, he's a waste manager, but it's a, a self-driven, he saw the need for waste management. And not only that, he trains other people to work with him, um, which forms an income for for him and his community, but is also a very vital part of the environment. And he thinks, what impressed me about him was he thinks very deeply about um, the harms that can be caused to the environment if waste is disposed badly. And so as part of our project, he's been speaking to the local government and bringing his voice to it. So I would like to ask Harriet, because we, we had the opportunity to make a film about what was <laughs> what Isaiah does. So I thought we could show that film first and then we'll have a discussion with Bernard um, about the impacts of climate change that he and uh, farmers in Kenya have are very real and that he's seeing now. And as Sarah was saying, you know, the, the broken places that things have already, um, things have already become problematic there. And then we'll talk to the young people about the importance of young voices in, 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 in these narratives. Thank you, Harriet. When the situation in Nobunga was worse, 
something went bad, it was worse. Uh, people used to dump carelessly. People used to throw their feces. So it was like a dump site. The reason why I got into waste management was that community was dirty and we realized there was a gap. My name is Raisayo Diambo. I was born, brought up in Obunga. I'm 28 years old. I'm married to one wife with two kids. They are girls. And one is three years old and another one is one years old. I was brought up with a single mother. I wanted a better life because I wanted to put my mom on in a better condition. Growing up, my mother is uh, selling a boga on Dele. So I used to go and help her. I wanted to make the business that I'm doing today a great business that can educate me because my mom could not manage to take me to the college. What I'm doing for a living is waste management, where we do collect waste from households and we get paid for the services. Yamistaka Investment started 2015 and registered Yamistaka Investment as partnership. We were five. Uh, one person managed to left, so we remain four of us. In Obunga, we do collect waste three times. After collecting, we do go, take them to the dump site now. Well, we collect waste using the hand cuts, and now we are using sacks. We, we always uh, give them sack, since sack can be reusable. We found that the standard paying price for the market of waste collection was 30 shillings per door for informal settlement, but 50 shillings per door for formal settlement. As Jamis, when collecting in informal settlement, you can manage to get 2,000 in a week, which sum up to 6,000 in a month. And then we have customers that are paying us monthly, the monthly client that are paying us 4,000. We have around 16,000 collected in a month. We, re we separate, we don't recycle now. We only separate plastic from waste that we've collected and we sell them to those who are doing plastic recycling. We don't get much from waste, but we are passionate about waste. So the area of waste recovery center, we need that. Our distance from where we are working to dump site is far. Then also within the informal settlement, we do not get enough cash. Sometimes you can be paid, sometimes a plant. The government has the capacity to manage waste management. I know they cannot reach the inside the community, more so in informal settlement. They can contract us to do the job. At least in an pair, as parent, as a provide for my kids. We've managed to employ some youths who are from school. The impact that Jamis has brought to the community is clean environment. The situation in Obunga currently, with the work we've done, uh, the community is now clean. It created a platform, a big platform for me. I've met different people in this world. Those who I never imagined that I could associate with. The community respect me a lot. So the job I'm doing, I'm proud of it.
Thank you so much, Harriet. May I please invite Bernard, Isaiah, Charlene, and Steve to switch their camera on. Um, and I just wanted to ask Bernard, so Bernard, as a, as a journalist, you tell stories and also you train people to tell stories. And I wonder, you know, sharing stories like these, like Isaiah's, you've been training people uh, who are journalists to better tell environmental stories. Um, and, and I wondered if you could talk about why that's so important to you. <clears throat> Thanks so much, uh, Aradi, for inviting me. And uh, in Kenya, it's evening. So when I greet you, good evening. Please uh, feel most welcome to this good evening in Kenya. Uh, I'll go very fast because we know we have limitation of time. And as Aradi has mentioned, uh, my name is Bernard. Uh, my journalist, I work for this is now my 26th year in uh, media, uh, writing and also training journalists. Yes, uh, we have been doing media trainings. As you realize, journalists cover a number of uh, topics, uh, some which are scientific. And as you know, things develop every day. And therefore, the journalists need that frequent or regular capacity building. Now. On the project that Arathi has mentioned that we have uh, been handling in Kisumu journalists and uh, waste managers like Isaiah, whose story we have just uh, seen here. And also we included the, the citizen journalist. Now we thought of including the journalist in this project and even other projects uh, because of the role that they play in the society, which I believe most of us know that they play very, very important role in reaching the masses, in reaching the population. I must also uh, tell maybe those of you who may not aware, we are in Kisumu, and uh, Kisumu is by the lake uh, shore of Victoria, Lake Victoria, and this region is highly impacted by climate change. Uh, but you find the media reporting, for example, on climate change is very, very low. Why? Because the topic climate change or even on waste management, waste management or environmental conservation is a somehow complicated topic. We don't compare it to, or we don't compare it with the politics, which is easy to report as journalists will tell you. And therefore, as community empowerment and media initiative, through partners like Aradi, we thought of bringing in the journalists. And of course, we have been working with the journalists uh, on that topic, on, on that project. And we, I can tell you for sure that there's a very big change when you compare when we began and now because of this uh, training. So yes, as I conclude I on your question, yes, we thought of including the journalists in this project and also many other trainings because of their role that they play. One, on advocacy, because they also do advocacy. One, two, is on information sharing and dissemination to the masses. When you go to radio, when you use newspaper, traditional media, or uh, the social media, particular traditional media, to reach a number of people. And of course, with traditional media, we believe all the credibility of the story. People want to believe and, and trust the information. And of course, when they get it from the, from, the, from the media, most of us take it as the gospel truth. And of course, because we do a lot of verification, but this can only be achieved when we invest in media and training them on a number of topics. Thank you so much. Thank you, Bernard. I wanted to bring Isaiah in as well now. Um, Isaiah, uh, can you hear me? Okay. Probably, uh, my name is Isaiah. Welcome, oh. Isaiah. Oh, thank you, thank you. I wanted to ask you something because you have been meeting the local government and you were saying that this it has created a platform for you by by sharing your stories. Um, how do you feel about your voices like yours bringing young people's voices people who are active because I, I think you are an expert that we learn from. Um, do you feel that um, 
you're able to speak to the local government and ask for tell share with them what your what your experiences are and what you need in uh, Obunga. Yeah, the local government has me out uh, in the way management. The sister has been given that cognizant in this community. So to play a role to help us grow. And you also do something interesting. You you work with other young people, don't you, in Obunga? And you also told me that you play football with children, but you also teach them about waste and not not throw, how to how to dispose of waste because it's become a big problem in your settlement. Yeah, yeah. within settlement, those doing waste, only street people, those working drugs. See, so in order for me to develop that interest and teach the community for our mother, brothers to understand that waste can be a wealth, it took time. We just sensitize the community first, tell them about the waste, and after that, we gauge uh, the acts on various activities like uh, making masks from waste so that they kill it with some plant rolls we and we buy rolls for them. But, uh, the, the profit get from the lecture, we buy the balls so that we can engage the kids so that they can not see us uh, uh, street people but can just understand that it's also a way we can earn from waste collection. Yes, thank you. Um, Bernard, uh, in, in addition to the waste management work that we're doing uh, like with Isaiah, you had also been working with farmers before and you told me an interesting, um, interesting stories about how the rains have already started changing and how how farmers have not been able to plant their crops and that leads to other impacts on the environment um, and i wondered if you could share share a little bit about that uh thanks so much Arati. yes uh, apart from the waste management project that we uh have in the four settlements in kisumu we have been training we have been and we continue to train to work with farmers and journalists and uh, community based organizations on uh, food and uh, on food security and uh, particularly targeting the informal settlement and also the peri urban areas of kisumu and lake victoria region uh, one when we started the this program or the initiative with farmers first it was really really difficult because even the farmers themselves who are supposed to be feeding themselves and also feeding the entire community were not even uh, some of them were not even sure of what we are talking about when we are talking about climate change in relation to food security. Now, you find majority of them, going back to your question, majority of them uh, believe in the traditional in the traditional way of thinking and the rain patterns that they used to experience in 1950s, 1960s. And you see from 1950, 1960, 1970, up to now 2021, where how many years? We are talking of 60, 50 years. And things have changed. And therefore, when we began this, and of course, that thing still happening in the rural areas in this region, that when you talk of climate change, for example, People think that ah, that's a European issue, that's an American issue, and it's not us here. Now, on the rains, they believe in planting session. Planting session. You say, ah, in this region, we normally plant March, April. That's and they tell you that's how you've been doing it. So even if the rains come in January or February, they say, no, our rains have not have not started. This one is another rain that's just passing. Ours will come in the month, month of March and April. 
But all these things have come because of climate change. So in this initiative of the farmers, the journalists, and the CBOs is to do what we call climate change literacy. Climate change literacy, which I would also uh, propose and suggest in this one here that we're discussing here, so that we see how we can enhance that, what we call climate change literacy project. Climate change literacy project. Because now, finally, on the rails, you know, when we started that, we started the training, and when we invited the, 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 the experts, they were talking of above normal rainfall, normal rainfall, and below normal rainfall. Now, the journalists were wondering, what are all these? Rain is rain. Why do you say above normal, normal, and below normal? Now, with the trainings of the weather people, the meteorologists and the journalists, now we came to a clear understanding as journalists because a journalist has to understand a concept and understand a topic, has to understand that issue first before packaging it well to disseminate it to the wider public through the various media, including the newspaper and the radio. Now we came through the new training that let us be clear and very simple, but uh, can be understood that above normal rainfall, we are talking of, of excess rainfall which lead to floods. Floods are literally are effects of climate change. That one, that local person will understand. When we talk of the normal rainfall, we are talking of that average rainfall that is suitable for uh, good production of the crop. Above normal floods which destroy the crop. And when we talk of below normal rainfall, we are talking of less rainfall, which is literally leads to I, I think drought. So I must say that farmers, we have gained a lot, one on nutrition and also food security. So I want to stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Bennett. This uh, climate change literacy is in a way what you're working with uh, the young people like Steve and Charlene from the informal settlements um, is about kind of environmental literacy and, and both of the things are keeping the story on the agenda so that it, it's high in public discussion but it's also in policy discussion so I wanted to invite Charlene and Steve. Uh, Steve could you put your if you're able to put your camera on if not I wanted I to ask you off. okay I wanted to ask you both about um, why you were interested in learning how to tell your story well and how to tell environmental stories from where you are. Shalene, maybe you can go first. Okay, good evening. Hi, good evening. Um, and uh, I think the major reason why I got interested in the citizen journalism, which, which, uh, okay, which was brought by the semi K, is because we had issues at the ground level, but the journalists were not able to air them out, and we felt like we should find a way to air them out. Luckily, we got help from the semi, whereby we were trained on how to be. Uh, good social, uh, good citizen journalist. We got the good elements, so now we can air out our stories, and it has been, it has been a perfect journey since then. Because with the, we find that most of the journalists they are not comfortable airing out stories with, to do with waste management, and there are things that are affecting us at the ground level. So when we come out. We make stories on things that are happening in our residential areas and we air them out on the social media platforms and it has attracted attention that actually this is what is happening in the ground level. Thank you. What are the problems you have seen in your environment and have you been frustrated in the past that you you're not able to do anything about it? Is, is this has this been a way of um of um thinking about how you can bring change. Okay, the major problem in the informal settlements around Kisumu is the poor waste management. 
happen that okay in every life situation there must be waste from households from factories and everything but now the problem comes when we have the waste but we don't have places to direct these waste so another challenge we are encountering is uh, the financial constraint challenges whereby these programs cannot be fueled without finances so you find the youths having a draw they having drawbacks to facilitate these programs they feel like if the government cannot come in why can why where why are we even doing this but with the encouragement they still feel okay the government cannot come in but we are the people who are living in this area and it is our responsibility to ensure that this area is safe Thank you. I wanted to ask Bernard and Isaiah because Isaiah is a waste manager from an informal settlement. Um, and I wanted to ask both of you, uh, also Charlene, you talked about the waste in the informal settlement that's not managed. How does that affect Kisumu as a whole? Because I, I'm really aware that Lake Victoria, it's not just on one country, it, 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 sh it shows on other countries as well. And I think it's become very apparent with the pandemic, with uh, climate change that what happens in one place doesn't stay in one place. It affects, it affects everyone. So I wondered what the impacts of bad waste management are for, for you, Isaiah. Okay, uh, within informal settlement, they do dispose waste carelessly, and lead to, like around the Ibunga, we have a river called The river is moving towards Lake Victoria. In fact, Lake Victoria March because people do dump when the flood, the rain rains, it flood up the river Kisat. Then the river Kisat drain the lake, the, the west into Victoria. We've tried to empower community by through edition. We've been doing it through door to door by engaging them. We tell them the impact, importance us collect for them the rest. Do you know within formal settlement people do depend on one dollar, no one dollar, do not manage to pay us. So with our services, we reduce within formal settlement. We do collect tellings, ten shillings uh, with within a household. So it is cheaper. They can afford that. But uh, if we use them a 50 shillings expensive, so it's, it's still a challenge to do waste within, to work with the informal settlement. We are doing it because we are the same community. It is very difficult to work with the informal settlement. So I, I think what I take from that is the importance of understanding the context of what people can afford and helping them to manage waste better by understanding that. Uh, Steve, I can see you. Uh, can you hear me? If you come off mute. Hi, hi, hi. Welcome. Uh, hello. Hi, hi, Steve. Can you hear us? Hello. Hello. I can hear you. Okay. Thank you so much for joining us. I wanted to ask you about your experience of learning about narratives to be able to share your stories. Why did you get involved with the project? As I said, by uh, we hear about uh, stories uh, related to politics, unlike uh, waste management. So we, I saw it as an initiative, uh, maybe to join uh, citizen journalists to get acquainted with the knowledge and touch, to use the same knowledge to enlighten my society on the importance of waste management. Okay, great. Yeah, uh, no, I, I wanted to ask Steve about why, um, whether he thinks that young people are getting more involved in, in driving this by, by being 
the ones who share the narratives through different means like like social media that you that young people use anyway Hello, it is it is important for the young people to join such uh, organizations because uh, in most cases we do interact with the wastes by ourselves within the communities so by airing out our stories we will attract such journalists to come and uh, uh, whatever is happening on the ground actually we are the people on the ground and when we get involved we'll sensitize others on the importance of these trainings uh, as a rat that wait for Radhi, I must say that um, the involvement of the youth that includes Charlene, the lady who has just spoken, and Steve who's uh, speaking, uh, the one who has just spoken for me, we thought of involving the youth, just like the two have said. They stay in the areas, those two areas, th those four uh, areas, and therefore they act as a link between the community and the practicing journalists. So that when a journalist meets what we call a story idea, their first point person is this youth in the settlement. And that's why we thought of training the youth to give them the basics of journalism. First, on how to identify a story, what makes a story, what we call the newsworthy element in a story, how they can identify that. Once they identify that, they link with the practicing journalist in the media, the radio, television, and newspaper to give it to the wider public. Finally, this team here, the youth, are also important because they are very savvy when we come when, when it comes to social media. So we are killing two birds with one stone, and the stone is the youth on the ground. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. That, that was that was wonderful. It was it was very good to hear from you and also from from Charlene, uh, Steve, and Asaya, and uh, you found some very uh, powerful words to, to, to speak about your experience, you know, sort of really making a difference, um, getting, getting people engaged, sort of explaining what it's all about. Um, so thank you. Um, please do stay online if you can. And uh, I hope Florian, that- Florian, I don't know. I don't know if you give me not ma not more than two minutes to say something. Please. Because Aradi had asked, Aradi had asked uh, you know, we lost uh, uh, Steve, but Aradi had asked a question to Isaiah and myself. So Isaiah had spoken, and uh, when I was to speak, then Steve that we lost came in. So please just give me not more than two minutes to say something. Of course, and then of course, proceed. of course, please. Yes. Uh, Aradi had asked Isaiah and myself on the impact, the impact of the project that we have in the informal segment Kisumu on waste management. Now, we want to connect this directly, waste management and climate change. And the connection is this. One, through the waste management in the four segments of Obunga, where Isaiah comes come from, of Kondele, where Shalim comes from, of Manyata, where Steve comes from, and Nyalenda, the waste management there has enabled us to make briquettes, briquettes that is used mainly by people in the informal settlements as a source of fuel for cooking. Now, the impact here that it now saves us a lot of trees instead of felling many trees to cut, cutting many trees for charcoal, now we use the waste in making the briquettes. And that has a direct impact when, when it comes to uh, issues of climate and climate change. Thanks so much, Florian and everyone. That's what I wanted to add. Thank and you. two, finally, 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 uh, Isaiah talked of, uh, in the informal statement, people throwing waste uh, anyhow. That has been, I must say that where I am right now, Florian, I mean, between, I'm saying in a place called uh, Nyawita, in between Obunga and Kondele, where Steve and uh, Charlene are. And I've stayed here for 30 years, so I'm talking of something that I know. Uh, now, Isaiah talks of waste being thrown anyhow. 
and this has been uh, a case and it has uh, led to blockage of drainage system. And you know, when the drainage system is blocked, it means a lot of impact, uh, health issues and environmental impact. So with the involvement of the waste managers like Isaiah and the CDG journalists, we have been able to have a number of impacts, both on our socioeconomic and health and environmental issues. Thanks so much. Thank you, thank you very much. And uh, again, you've made a really important point. It's the experience, it's the experience that comes with being there and sort of understanding the community, understanding the pressures and, and really sort of uh, being able to sort of see the interaction between the environment and uh, the, uh, the, the community and the sort of developments in the community. So you've, you've spoken all very powerfully to this. Thanks again. Um, we, we will move on to our next group now, but there will be time um, for anybody in the audience to share questions with you, um, Steve, Bernard, Charlene, and uh, Isai, if you want to, if you check the Q&A, and you can reply to these uh, directly in the chat. And if you're able to stay until the end, we can also sort of discuss it further. So thank you very much again. That was brilliant. Um, and we are now on to our third um, case study or, or third panel, if you wish. Um, we're moving to South Africa now, and we are, we've spoken to a group of um, uh, student, uh, sorry, of, of journalist activists in their 20s. Um, and we're now talking to younger people, um, to school age, second, uh, secondary school age uh, activists. Uh, uh, in particular, we're talking to Arya Matai and to Almaz Mudali, and I'm very grateful to you both for joining us. They will be introduced properly uh, by Beth Jennings. I'm very happy that um, Beth could join us uh, at such short notice, uh, replacing Anthony Costello. You'll be presenting the work of the CAP 2030 initiative, which is a very large initiative, um, children in all policies. And uh, uh, Bethany Jennings who is going to sort of speak to us about this initiative and be in conversation with our two invited guests is a social scientist specializing in gender inequality and qualitative research. She's worked in the areas of child protection, homelessness, exploitation, holistic services and participation in the UK and in Bangladesh. Her work aims to highlight the experiences and amplify voices of marginalized groups. Bethany works as a consultant with CAP 2030, as I mentioned, to ensure meaningful participation of children and adolescents and supports the working groups of this initiative, particularly for country implementation and climate change advocacy. So advocacy is very much something which I'd like to explore with you and also how advocacy can be enabled through education and through different ways of sort of writing and uh, publishing and using online media as well. So um, Beth, over to you and thank you very much. Hi, um, can everyone see me? Yes, we can. Okay, okay, <laughs> great. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Um, it's great to be here. Um, it's just been so fascinating listening to everyone talk so far. And I am sorry that Anthony can't be here. I know that he would have, have, have loved to be. Um, yes, as, as um, you said, I, I work with Anthony at Children and um, All Policies, or CAP 2030 for short. Um, so we are a very new initiative, um, just launched in April. Um, but we, we aim to place children's health and well-being at the heart um, of all policies. Um, and, and to implement the recommendations of the WHO UNICEF Lancet uh, Commission Report, um, A Future for the World's Children, that was published last year. Um, so the report highlighted um, the importance of investing in children, of multi-sectoral working, of listening to children's voices, and the threat of uh, the climate emergency. Um, so, so much of the report in CAP 2030's work is relevant um, to what we're, we're discussing today. Um, 
In particular, we, we recognise the importance of working across sectors, and that includes the arts. Um, and we know that the arts are essential to our well-being and the well-being of children. Um, and they're essential, it's, um, the arts are essential to us as individuals, as communities, and a society. Um, and expressing ourselves, um, sharing and others' expressions um, can reduce stress, it creates a community, a common purpose, um, aids learning and growth. Um, and for all those reasons, uh, when we um, think about responding to, to the climate emergency, um, it's, it's essential that You've just lost the sound there, um, Bethany. So we would just allow you to rejoin using the link. The, 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 oh, you're here. You're back. <laughs> I'm back. Okay. Um, yeah. Sorry about that. Um, yeah. So, so I was saying that the, the um, young people, children, have really led the way in responding to the climate crisis. I think we've seen that um, all over the world. Um, and we know that it is a children's right to be heard, but we also we don't often appreciate just how much uh, children have to contribute um, in raising awareness um, and finding solutions. Um, and so we have two um, amazing examples of young women who have responded to the climate crisis um, using verbal art. Um, and so it's my my pleasure to introduce Almas and Aria um, from South Africa, they're both students, um, and they're going to share their experiences with us. Um, so can we start with Almas? Can you, you tell us about the advocacy work that you've been involved in? Good afternoon, good evening, or good morning. I'm Almas and I'm a grade nine student at Rodin School in South Africa. Why is it that when we talk about climate change, it's always fraught with complexity. When we talk to young people, we shouldn't be talking about carbon sequestration. We need to talk simply about rather taking carbon out of the atmosphere. In general, people cannot fathom these scientific terms. Don't get me wrong, science is fantastic and is absolutely needed, but not everything needs to be explained in scientific terms. We need to cool the earth by one and a half degrees. But how many of us know the difference between 25 and 26 and a half degrees on a sunny day? I don't mean to criticize Al Gore, but if you look at some of he, the statistics that he presents, you need a four year degree to understand what he is saying. Imagine a 14 year old youth like myself, trying to learn about climate change. Put yourself in our shoes, Mr. Al Gore. In South Africa, we are in the process of developing our first national youth climate action plan, known as the YCAP. It serves as a master document of the youth in South Africa's view on climate change with the policy, implementation, art and story section. It is my job as the high school liaison to make sure all high school kids are equally represented. I, along with my colleagues, are planning a climate change awareness roadshow in order to educate and gather input into the YCAP. The Youth Climate Action Plan aims to give all children a voice, and this is why we've opted to allow children who may not be able to relay their messages in mainstream scientific language an opportunity to convey their messages in the form of stories and other mediums of art. This is why we are issuing a nationwide call for stories to be implemented into the Youth Climate Action Plan. I'm proud to say that we are the first, but I hope that we are not the last to implement art into policy. It will be wonderful if youth from other countries or even governments use the South African Youth Climate Action Plan as an example for a holistic policy that everyone can emulate. Climate change is often seen as a privilege problem. And it's because those that are under privilege aren't given access to education or rather viable education on climate change that they can understand. This is where climate education through storytelling could help immensely to bridge the education divide. 
When we started planning the roadshow and speaking with high school students of all socioeconomic backgrounds around South Africa, climate change was still seen as a distant issue. After a severe drought in South Africa due to climate change, people are feeling the dire effects of climate change, but can't connect the dots to see that their strife is because of climate change. This is why education is key when solving the climate crisis, so that we can create visibility around the intersectionality of climate change. We should not only be speaking to the students about facts. We have to realize, we've realized that art, drama, music, and the arts in general can play a big role in educating the youth on, climate, on the climate crisis and how they can get involved. And that is why we have a whole section dedicated to storytelling and art in the YCAP. From our interactions with youth in South Africa, affluent youth issues seem to be different to underprivileged youth. For example, affluent youth want to implement no plastic campaigns, while some more underprivileged youth also don't want to pollute the environment, but they're interested in issues such as food security and poverty. As a matter of fact, some of these youth are using plastic grocery bags as school bags. The science may show that plastic is only bad, but if we do not listen to people's stories, we will never know of the people that are using plastic and making something good out of it. If we want to implement good policy, it is our job to see those needs and the intersectionality of those needs. We will never be able to understand these issues if we don't welcome the submission of stories into the climate change agenda. <clears throat> we will never achieve a just green transition to solve climate change. We cannot leave anyone behind. But educating using stories can work both ways. The Youth Climate Action Plan will be a document different from traditional policy documents as it will have sections of art, digital media and stories, as I said. Governments especially don't provide regulation that is multilateral and don't inspire people to change. What we need in terms of regulation is for everyone to have a voice and a say, because we have to recognize, especially with climate change, that a one size fits all strategy will never work. Policy today is not understandable. I think it's absolutely crazy that we use such high language for policy and don't make policies accessible when it's what governs our societies. I strongly believe that if we use storytelling in policy, we can solve these issues. South Africa has a proud heritage of activism starting way back in our history. If there's one thing we know how to do, it is to protest. And it won't come as a surprise that in South Africa, we have protest theater that was extremely effective in our fight against apartheid. So why don't we use this blueprint of our past successes in the climate change space? When South Africans wanted to convey a strong message during the apartheid era, they took to protest theater and masterf masterpieces such as Serafina were born as a result and songs such as Give Me Hope, Joanna. The arts pull at our heartstrings and give us hope and inspiration. This is the type of innovation we need to bridge the gap between sci the science of climate change and the art of climate change. The movie Serafina has invoked all of my emotions and made me truly reflect on our racist past and our non-racist future in South Africa. The arts can help, as it did in the apartheid era, to change the hearts and the minds of people to combat climate change. I truly believe if we use means of workshop theater to educate about climate change, we can, con we can convey strong, impactful messages. Even though much more verbal art is needed in the climate change space, movies and stories about climate change do exist today. But I'm of the opinion that storytelling today is heavily flawed. I feel like climate change stories are always fiction and begin when climate change has already happened and we have faced a massive extinction. To an, to an extent, I think this can be effective but these kinds of stories encourage the so-called apocalypse paralysis. 
I think one of our main mistakes when tackling climate change over the past few years is that people are creating this doomsday scenario, but what we really need is to bring hope and inspiration to inspire action. I implore you to watch the movie or play Serafina and experience through the art of movie making, how you can feel inspired to tackle racism. Let's do the same for climate change. Thank you. I will now hand over to my fellow Rodinian, Arya Matai. Hi everyone, um, my name is Aria, I'm 17 and I'm completing my final year at Rodin School South Africa. Um, before I start, I just want to say thank you so much for having me on this panel. I found what everyone's had to say so interesting and I'm really excited to have the opportunity to share some of the initiatives that I've been involved in. So I'm the student leader of my school's social responsibility group. To give some background to our social responsibility program, I'll just read a short extract from our framework. Sustainable social development is at the core of all Rodin projects that are conceptualized with our community partners. The UN Sustainable Development Goals are made explicit to the pupils as the implementation helps to achieve overall, helps to achieve overall development plans, reduce future economic, environmental and social costs, strengthen economic competitiveness and reduce poverty. This provides the pupils the opportunity to look outwards universally and realize that integration and innovation are key to achieve the sustainable development goals. Projects are designed within a social development framework as opposed to that of charity, emphasizing the importance of sustainability, effectiveness and impact to the community. I mentioned that Rodin has community partners. We work with two of these partners, Noah Yeovil and Christchurch Care Centre, to educate the children about climate change and action. Children from these organisations are from the inner city of Johannesburg and are often very vulnerable, grappling with day-to-day -day poverty. The organisations offer the children a safe space, a meal, and we try to help with resources to improve numeracy and literacy. In South Africa, there is roughly 25 to 30 percent functional literacy at a grade four level. One of the main aims of the SDGs is equal access to quality education, which is SDG four. And our Monday social responsibility projects are an attempt to be fulfilling this aim. Before COVID, we had children from Noah Yeovil and Christchurch Care Centre visit our school every Monday afternoon. In this time, they paired up with the Rodine student volunteer who would help them with homework, reading, learning how to use computers, basic numeracy and literacy. Our relationships with these community partners are long-term and stretch the form of food aid. In collaboration with Almaz's work on climate action, we felt that it's important that we shift the perception that climate change is an elitist struggle. Last year, Omar's helped draft the Johannesburg City Action Climate Plan, which emphasized the importance of educating all youth on climate change. Um, I think the word inclusion is, um, you know, a great guide for this discussion. Um, we started to focus on SDG 13, which is climate action with our community partners. Due to COVID, our interactions were no longer face-to-face. -face. The Rodian volunteers made fun video lessons, read storybooks, and put together worksheets about climate for the inner city children. These lessons were aimed at providing the, student, the students with a basic understanding of climate change by introducing definitions, terms, and concepts in a creative manner. This is a launch pad for more in-depth understanding and hopefully some action. In the lessons, the Rodin volunteers encourage both engagement with us and with their community. In some lessons, we introduced ourselves and the lessons included videos of ourselves acting out scenes to explain concepts or tell stories about climate change. In others, we encouraged poster making about climate change or an area litter cleanup. The important gap that we're trying to bridge here is between literate and illiterate youth. We cannot rely on high profile policy documents as many children would get left behind. 
the lessons for literacy skills as the children are required to read, answer questions, spell, give their opinions and understand instructions. But they also encourage the children to be interested in and invested in issues around climate change. Storytelling has played an important role in making sure that all youth is educated about climate change. Thank you. Beth, I think you, you need to switch on your mic. Yeah. Sorry. Um, thank you both. I think we can all agree that. Can you hear me now? Sir? Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, I think we can all agree that was very inspiring um, and, and yeah, really, really wise um, uh, suggestions about how we can be more inclusive and how we can tell um, uh, or um, allow different people to contribute um, in, in uh, climate advocacy. Um, I'd be really interested to hear from both of you um, what your, um, as individuals have been involved um, in, in climate advocacy, what have your um, greatest um, struggles been, but also our challenges, but also what have you found most rewarding um, in this journey? Uh, I don't know who wants to start. Almas, do you want to say something? Yes, so I think one of the main challenges that I have faced is that when you interact with big business or I don't want to generalize, but I think more adults, they seem to be very closed to having the youth opinions. And they 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 don't want to, they they don't inspire action. For example, I was on a on a discussion with some of the biggest businesses, but also the biggest polluters in South Africa. And it had our um, ESCOM, which is the energy making um, company in South Africa. And um, I don't want to name names, but there was also some mining companies and some car companies. And we, the youth were, we were relaying our messages and um, what we wanted to see from these businesses in terms of climate action and how they could involve social responsibility into their companies. And I was met with a lot of hostility. Like they were saying things like we needed to give them ideas. And I think before we try and comment on their businesses, and I think in terms of climate action, one of my biggest challenges that I faced is that social responsibility and um, taking care of, an, of our environment isn't, put into company values and even sometimes school values. So it's not really part of our culture. And in terms of climate change, we need to ensure a culture change like it was done in, the, um, in America with the American space program. There was a whole different culture change taken to rather see space travel as innovation and everyone um, felt I don't, like inspired in a way that their country was taking part in such a big initiative and in achieving such big goals. Thank you, I hope that answers the question. Yeah, definitely. No, that's really, really interesting. Um, um, yeah. Um, um, Aria, did you want to answer what's been challenging about your- Yeah, sure. So I think when we went online and basically when we stopped, um, you know, going to physical school and stopped being able to have face-to-face um, -face contact with our community partners, it definitely made our program a lot harder because we weren't sort of sure what um, level of engagement um, our lessons were being met with. And we weren't sure how to make them, you know, most impactful. Um, and at the same time, you know, during COVID, a lot of people have lost jobs and really struggled and it's been tough to manage um, sort of what these people's like greatest needs are and often it's really not receiving worksheets or lessons about climate change it might just be getting a meal mm -hmm. um, so in times like that we really have had to prioritize um, you know other forms of um, or like other initiatives like maybe a food parcel soup making 
sort of course or something like that um, instead of instead of going on with these worksheets despite their importance because you know there's the, you know some needs just come before others um, and that's been um, you know obviously quite tough um, but it's also really rewarding we got a video at the end of at the end of last term I think with um, basically all the kids just saying like sending us videos and we hadn't we haven't seen their faces in really long we haven't met with them in um, months so it was really cool to see all of them and they were just saying thank you for the lessons and what they found interesting and which worksheets they liked and which concepts they understood and that was um, that was really awesome to see. Yeah yeah that's amazing. Um, I think I think from both your uh, from what both of you have said there's a real um, you know the hope comes the hope and inspiration and creativity all really comes across really strongly um so how how do you think what would your advice be for encouraging young people like yourself but also um as you talked about inclusion and and people uh, children in different circumstances um yeah how how what sort of practical steps do you think need to be taken um, to to inspire young people to be involved. Um, I can go first. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. So I think one of the issues that youth have when trying to interact with climate change, um, even in the policy space, is that the the whole area isn't really created for us. And then when we do participate in these types of events, then we feel like we have to sort of make up for it and we have to do really well. So I think for youth that want to get involved, I mean, the first thing that you can do is go and read your, your city's policies and um, it might even help you identify all of the injustices that are happening in your community. And um, I also think you could start your own clubs, I mean, and uh, gather your friends around because, you know, we're stronger in numbers. And um, I know in South Africa, we have lots of initiatives in terms of for climate change. And they're all separate. And I think that as youth, it's our, it would be amazing if we could then all come together and have one big driving force. Mm -hmm. And in terms of climate action, I mean, we've known about climate action for so long. And the issue is that it hasn't been prioritized. So if, that, if youth can go into their schools and start actually advocating for climate change. And um, I know I have a friend that he goes to a school and at this school, they, some of the kids really don't care about climate change. And I mean, I found it very surprising because at my school, climate change is quite a big thing. And he is starting to go and trying to implement some of our initiatives that we're doing within the YCAP into his school. So I think my main message is that if you are, if you are, if you're passionate about what you're doing in terms of climate change, you can never be wrong. And I mean, just have the confidence to go into all of these spaces and give your opinion. Thank you. Um, I definitely don't have much to add on from what Omar said. I just think it's important to, I think every like small amount of effort does help um, wherever you can to spread information or to educate yourself, um, to start small initiatives. I mean, even just, you know, a meat free Mondays type thing mm -hmm. or something like that, things, things like that, or once they, you know, compound on each other, they all, um, you know, eventually start to make a difference. And the more people that are aware of these, you know, the issues that we're facing, the better. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank Yeah, thank you both. Um, it's been really inspiring. Um, I think that's our time done. Um, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, that was it was it was very interesting and uh, and exciting to listen to you and uh, we're very grateful. There are some questions for the two of you in the Q&A, which you would maybe uh, want to look at and, and answer. Um, before we have a general discussion, um, I'm very happy to welcome our two respondents. Um, I'm very 
pleased and, and a little bit nervous to have uh, two such distinguished uh, respondents here with us. They're both here, not only as, uh, as writers, as uh, thinkers, as scholars, but also as activists. And I'll introduce them there, uh, Liz Jensen and Elena Wöckringelbach. Um, maybe I'll introduce you both, if I may, and then I'll ask Liz first to share some thoughts and then uh, hand over to, to Elaine. Um, I just wanted to say a few words. Um, there's a lot I could personally say about uh, Liz because I'm a great fan of, of her work. Um, I'm also very happy to announce that in the context of this wider initiative, uh, Sustainability as Cultural Practice, Liz has agreed to come to UCL in the autumn of uh, 2021. We hope that this will be an online event, so uh, we might be able to share it with uh, your organizations again. Um, we'll be in touch about this. But just to say that Liz Jensen is one of Britain's most influential authors of speculative fiction. She's written a number of novels. Um, the first one is from 1995, Egg Dancing. Uh, then there are some satirical novels, Ark Baby of 1998, War Crimes for the Home of 2002, the dystopian novel, The Paper Eater of 2000, and then the psychological thriller, The Ninth Life of Louis Drax, uh, 2004, which became the basis for a Canadian-American film directed by Alexandra Aija in 20. 16. More recently, she's written a time travel comedy called My Dirty Little Book of Stolen Time and two dark ecological thrillers called The Rapture and The Uninvited, which are very central to, to many of the things that we've been discussing. Um, all these books were published in the UK by Bloomsbury and have been translated in many European languages. Uh, also, it's really important, I think, in the context of our discussion today to mention that Liz is a, a founder member of Extinction Rebellion's Writers' Rebel, a literary movement using words and actions to highlight the climate and ecological emergency. So, um, Liz, maybe you would want to, to share um, some first thoughts in response to what we all listen to today and also talk a little bit about your experience as a as a writer, as an artist, and also your work with Extinction Rebellion's Writer Rebel. Yes, thank you so much for having me. And it's been such a pleasure to hear everybody and, and so many different voices and coming at this huge issue that we all face from, from such different, um, different communities um, and every single one of them so important. We've been talking about storytelling. Um, we've been talking about um, you know, traditions in, in Ethiopia of the oral tradition of storytelling. And then we've talked about citizen journalism and we've talked about what young people can do in terms of, you know, conveying the story that is so important. And in a way for me as a fiction writer, but also as a, as a former journalist and now as an activist, um, it is all one big story that we're part of. And I'm more and more aware of that, uh, that each and every one of us is contributing in some way to that story. Um, and it's not just about voices um, being able to emerge, it's about voices being heard. Uh, because as, um, as we heard just now um, from, uh, from the Aria and from, from uh, Amaz, who are talking to us from South Africa. Um, it's, a, it's about um, making sure that people get the message. And it's a message that's very painful. Um, uh, Amaz was talking about emotions. She was talking about storytelling being flawed. And I agree with her. I think storytelling has been rather flawed. And, and actually, if I look back on what I have written about climate change, I think my own storytelling has been quite flawed because I think there is um, quite a lot of criticism now about dystopian fiction. I think it can do wonderful things. Uh, I think it, it serves as a, a, a brilliant warning. And I think the power of the human imagination is incredible. And that's wonderful, but those stories depress people. Um, and I think the last thing we need at the moment is to feel depressed because when we feel depressed, we can't act. We can't do what we need to do. And as we know, there is more and more to do because 
as we also know, we've known about climate change for many, many years, for decades, and uh, done nothing about it. And it's getting worse. It's not getting better. It's getting worse. And we can see that every day. Um, I was looking at some in images today from Madagascar where people are starving. They're eating leaves and leather because of what has happened with the drought in that country and soil erosion. And so it is in so many places over the world. There are floods, there are fires. It can all, it feels very ap apocalyptic right now. But of course the message that we send should not be apocalyptic because there is actually a huge amount that can be done. And I think our storytelling needs to, to focus on that as well. And, and that's why it's so fantastic to hear from the citizen journalists um, who are writing about waste management and spreading the message about waste management because we can feel completely overwhelmed when we look at it as a whole. And I think that's why um, literature and storytelling and, and all forms of art have actually failed us in many ways uh, over the past decade in particular. I think it's picking up now and the tide is turning a little bit. Um, but yeah, I think it's, it's just so crucial that we bear in mind that what we're feeling and it's very much about feelings. You know, you can, you can talk about science, you can give people facts, and it's very hard to absorb sometimes, but what people do recognize immediately is their own emotions and the emotions they see in other people. And that's why I think it's really crucial to emphasize, um, to begin with, the fact that we're all feeling a certain level of grief about the climate and ecological emergency. Our world, the world we love, the world we grew up in is changing. Uh, I'm, I'm in my early 60s and I remember a time when there were insects everywhere. Uh, and I, they used to annoy me, we used to kill them. They were so annoying. And if you drove somewhere in a car um, in the summer, your windscreen would be covered, it would be splattered in insects. Well, they're gone now, they're almost gone. Um, certainly where I am speaking to you from now in, in France, I see very, very few insects and that means fewer birds. And there's a cascade, cascading effect um, uh, on all of us. And we see it over time. And time is the other issue with storytelling. How do you convey something that actually happens over a large spread of time? So these are all issues that we need to look at as storytellers. And, and, and look at our audience. What do they like? What do they like to read? What, what songs do they like? What, what is the best medium for getting this message across in a way that can be constructive, in a way that can be hopeful? And when I talk about hope, um, I think hope's a difficult word. Hope has become a very difficult word for me because it's so vague. And people say, well, let's just hope this, or let's just hope that, let's hope they do something about it. That's not really good enough anymore. I think the only kind of hope that works is active hope. And I think that's what we've been seeing today with all the wonderful speakers who've been on. We've been seeing people who, who are hoping and doing something about it. So that's what I would like to say just to kick off. Thank you, thank you. I I think, I, I mean, I, 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 it's really interesting that you should mention hope. And I think hope is very different from optimism, isn't it? I mean, hope is, 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 is about sort of facing an unknown future and, and facing it very often. And, uh, and I was just speaking of the difference of our perspectives. I was, I was certainly very struck listening to Anmas earlier, and Anmas, when you said that uh, all this has been going on for a very long time, it 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 gained a different meaning. Um, I I have children myself, and uh, my oldest is, is almost exactly your age, but it, still, it's sort of it's a different experience for me to listen to this um, coming from you, and um, and how quickly our sense of the sort of the time that is that is passing and the time. Uh, that we are we are losing and that is no longer at our disposal is you know how, how that is shifting between between generations. So I think I'm, I'm very grateful for for these um, for, for for these points that you make, Liz. I was wondering if you could say a little bit more, if you wanted to say a bit more about your own activist work um, as well. 
um, how you, you try to, I mean, moving from the, the idea of, as if you spoke about the fact that, that arts and, and literature is more, is perhaps in a different way now central, you know, and uh, this is something which we hope to obviously also address in our series. So I was wondering how that worked for you concretely with uh, the, the network, uh, the writers uh, network working with Extinction Rebellion. Yes, well, Writers Rebel um, was, well, I founded it with a, a couple of other writers uh, back in 2019. And um, at that point, I had read a book that had a huge influence on me by the Indian writer and academic Amitav Ghosh, um, novelist and, and uh, a wonderful climate thinker. Um, and this book was called The Great Derangement. And in it, he castigated literature for not rising to the occasion uh, of, of climate, of the climate and ecological emergency. And um, it really moved me to read this because I felt he was right. And I had, although I had done my, my small bit uh, in writing a couple of novels about, about the issue sort of fairly early on, I, I, um, I came to think that really wasn't enough. Um, he speaks about um, this as being a, a cultural problem. Climate change is a cultural problem, he says. And uh, he calls it, he called his book The Great Derangement because he's referring to this weird mindset that we have been in, whereby we, we deny what's going on around us. We can't deal with it. And so we step back for it. And it's always happening somewhere else, except actually it's happening on our own doorsteps. There's not a single place in the world that has not been affected by this emergency or will not be affected in the very near future. Um, so, I mean, he says that when future generations look back on the great derangement, they will certainly blame reader, uh, leaders and politicians for their failure to address the issue, but they may well hold artists and writers to account as well. Um, for the imagining of possibilities is not the job of politicians and bureaucrats. Um, he's saying it's our job. It's the culture's job as well. We're the ones with the imaginations. And I think, um, you know, when, when um, uh, Almaz was saying one of the challenges she's facing is, you know, you go to these, you know, you go to big business and you go to, you know, a fossil fuel company or a car company or a, a great big rich, ugly polluter, and you say, look what you've done, they say, well, give us the answers then, uh, as if it's not their job to clear up their own mess, but they don't see it as their job to clear up their own mess. And that's why we need young activists and, and older activists <laughs> more and more. So um, Writers Rebel uh, is part of Extinction Rebellion, which is now a worldwide group of grassroots activists um, operating in many, many countries now. Um, and it, it started up really out of a feeling that everything that's happened so far in activism, although activism has done great work and there are wonderful organizations, hasn't done enough and it hasn't done it quickly enough. Um, so uh, it's scientists, doctors, um, just ordinary citizens who care, a lot of people with children, a lot of, a lot of families, um, join Extinction Rebellion because they're so worried about the future of their children. Um, anyway, I, I'm not much on social media, but I'm on Twitter and I saw a tweet by a fellow writer who I respect a lot, Monique Roffey. And she says, Does any, are there any other writers out there who care about climate change? And I instantly wrote back because I happened to see it. But I was one of very, very few people who did. And then we had a conversation and we spoke to a couple of the other people who'd replied and we said, well, let's get together and talk about this. And what can we do? Let's do something. So it was, we met in a pub in London at some point and um, my, uh, I had already been part of Extinction Rebellion on a sort of very low key level, uh, but I, my son was very involved and I spoke to him and he said, well, let me put you in touch with someone in Extinction Rebellion. And it was born there. And then before we knew it, we had a, a wonderful sort of pop-up literary festival in Trafalgar Square, which was then occupied um, by Extinction Rebellion. And then we had some really fantastic, you know, 
famous writers reading uh, work they had written specially in some cases. Uh, and we discovered that writers are passionate about it. They just didn't know how to go about it. Um, they didn't know what to do. They were just waiting for some kind of platform where they could actually express all these very, you know, deep feelings that, that, uh, that they have about what's going on. So it developed from there and we've done various events. We've got a website um, called writersrebel.com where we have lots and lots of blogs and we have various activities. And recently um, we did a new action. This is called Paint the Land. And the idea is to, it's very much about, you know, verbal art actually, because what we do is we team up, um, we've just launched it. So we've had our first event. We, we teamed, the Booker Prize winning uh, Nigerian writer, Ben Okri, uh, with a couple of wonderful artists called Ackroyd, or, uh, Ackroyd and Harvey, who work in grass. And um, just to give you an, a, a flavor of what we did with our first action, the idea is to, to create giant graffitos because I was just thinking, well, if no one's getting the message, if the people who can make the decisions are not getting the message, Let's write that message beautifully, poetically, in words that are just too big to miss. So maybe we could show the little film of that event, which happened last Friday in central London on the River Thames. That would be great. I think Harriet, Harriet has got the copy of the film, so we can show that now. So here we are, that's St Paul's, St. Paul's Cathedral. <laughs> future weeping our love must save the world and it was a it was a wonderful event I wasn't there I saw it online like a lot of other people um, but uh, the idea was to do it in in organic materials so we had living grass and the yellow is actually also grass uh, it's just been covered in a kind of stencil so that the photosynthesis doesn't work so that's what grass looks like when it doesn't get the light um, and uh, we floated it on the river for several hours. And fortunately for us, the police didn't come and shut it down as they often do with Extinction Rebellion protests. Um, and Ben Oakley's message, he thought about it really long and hard because he said, we don't want to go for fear. Um, fear puts people off. We don't want to scare anyone. We want to talk about the love we feel for this planet, which is our shared home. Um, and and we want to talk about children as well. So, so this is why he came up with those words. And, uh, and, and it's a slightly unusual message for Extinction Rebellion to give because normally they're much more sort of hard hitting, but we're writers and we're artists and this is the way we do it. And the idea was also to reach people who normally aren't reached by that, by what Extinction Rebellion does. And these are people who are often quite high powered. They think of themselves as great art lovers, great literature lovers. And, and this is art and literature kind of biting back at them and saying, yeah, think with your heart for once. Think with your heart, stop thinking with your wallet. Yeah, it's really, it's really interesting. Uh, there's a longer, but there's a reportage from that uh, event which you shared and which um, I think we can share with participants after this event because it's very interesting. You can see different people speaking about sharing their thoughts and in response to the to the provocation. But I, I really also really like that you have sort of art and, and literature biting back. I must say, I think it's a wonderful image. 
um, I was, I think, that, I, yeah. Can I just say one, one quick thing about that Paint the Land campaign is, our idea was to just put a couple of pieces out there. We'll be doing a couple more in the run up to COP. But the, the main idea is, is just to say to anyone who, who loves words and loves art, make your own, wherever you are, make your own. It's, it's very easy to do. It doesn't have to be grown in grass and floated on a river. It can be, it can be made in, you know, out of old plastic. It, it, you know, they don't have to be sort of beautiful landscapes. Um, with you know, flowers growing, although they can be, they can be messages that highlight an issue in your local community. So I just wanted to plant that thought. Thank you so much. And it's, it goes right back also to what the ambassador said at the very beginning when she said this is, you know, we need to, to be aware that um, some of this is, is the result of a failure of the imagination. So I think, you know, this is, this is the response of the imagination um, that we've seen on so many levels uh, from, from Kenya, from Ethiopia to South Africa and, and back to London, where I, I haven't been for a very long time, actually. So when I saw this, I felt quite nostalgic for since the start of the pandemic, I haven't been able to set foot there. Um, so it, it also made me very aware of the place. Um, I, I wanted to bring Elaine uh, Neuve Kringelbach into this conversation as well um, with, with Liz Jensen. Um, and uh, Elaine is Associate Professor of African Anthropology and Vice Dean Equality, Diversity and Inclusion in my faculty, in the Faculty of Arts and Humanities at UCL. And her own work is actually focused on dance and family migration which she explores in the context of West Africa and also of the West African diaspora through the common lens of mobility. So she's done a lot of research in Senegal, France and the UK and has published on this in a series of, of books and co-edited volumes. So uh, clearly, Elaine, you, you will be able to, to relate to much of, of what has been said in, in different ways. And I was just wondering if you wanted to share any of your impressions. Thanks a lot, Florian, um, and thank you so much for inviting me to take part. I'm delighted to also share this conversation with Liz, um, who is a, a long time friend. And uh, actually, Liz, it was great to hear about your inspiration from Amitav Ghosh's book, because actually Florian and I have had conversations about uh, The Great Derangement by Amitav Ghosh. So that's clearly something that has inspired us all in different ways. Um, so as Florian said, I'm an anthropologist and I've done some of my research on dance and music, popular culture in Senegal in the past. I'm not an expert on climate change. So I'm, I'm just, I just want to say uh, a short commentary on the different presentations, but not from the point of view of an expert at all, um, from the point of view of a, a concerned citizen, someone who believes very strongly in the value of the arts uh, to say something important about these issues. And also as an activist, uh, because as just as Liz, I'm also part of Extension Rebellion. I mean, the, I mean one of the many samba bands that have um, um, been created across the UK to support um, demos, to, to support the message and the idea is, is also um, that we can amplify the message about the need to fight the climate emergency and through music reach people who might otherwise be put off by more conventional forms of discourse. And it seems to be working. Every time we play, a lot of people stop who might not otherwise stop just reading the placards and ask us what this is all about. And we have very interesting conversations with people of all ages, wherever we play. Uh, but coming back to the different presentations, which I thought were all excellent and really blew me away, um, I, I really I, I connected uh, really with Sarah's presentation, and that resonated very much with my experience of the importance of oral literature in Senegal. And I agree that oral literature is a modern phenomenon, absolutely. It shouldn't be seen as an obsolete legacy from the past, and it has to be taken seriously as a literary genre. I also think that this is one of the ways through which um, insights from the oral genres that we see 
um, in Africa, in, in the Horn of Africa and in West Africa, um, the way in which they work to communicate messages, but also to create spaces where people uh, from different social categories can participate, can discuss ideas, can discuss political ideas. I think that has that should help us to rethink the value of making such spaces in European societies. There just isn't enough space where people can come together across social classes, across ethnic groups, for example, and debate in a very participatory and positive way. I really like the idea that the verbal apps can help us to develop new cognitive schema, which Sarah also mentioned. Um, I've been thinking myself about the, the power, um, the kind of power that the spoken word has uh, to spur us into the radical changes that we need to preserve our planet and fight this climate emergency. Does the spoken word perhaps have inher inherently restorative dimensions? And I would argue that yes, um, oral performance, uh, as we can see from, from Ethiopia and as I know from, from Senegal and West Africa, oral performance has the potential to be restorative and it has the potential to remind us that um, we really need to rethink the relationship between human and non-human entities and that we really need to rethink the relationship between people and place. And I really liked the examples that Sarah brought about um, the way in which people use music, song and oral performance to reconnect with places from which they have been displaced, for example. I've seen this um, in Senegal, and I think these are societies that remind us that a relationship to place isn't just about owning a piece of land and having the papers to that piece of land. Ownership isn't just about legal status or having the money to, be, to buy a piece of land, that there are different ways of conceiving of relationship with a place. And I was thinking particularly about the label people in Coastal Senegal, um, who've been perhaps not so much displaced as their territory has been uh, encroached throughout colonialism by the French. And then after in the post-colonial period, much of their land has been appropriated by the Senegalese state. So they've lost uh, the Cape Verde Peninsula that uh, used to be their territory and from which they practiced both fishing and agriculture. But they um, have also found very dynamic ways in which they can reaffirm at least a form of spiritual ownership of that land. And they do that by performing regular rituals every year in crucial parts of the peninsula, rituals that involve the spoken word, song, music, and also dance and which is so powerful that they, they always inevitably remind people, they remind politicians and they remind every, everyone in the city um, that they are still a force to be reckoned with. And that if they became completely dispossessed and completely displaced, then everyone's relationship to that land might be seriously compromised. And I think whether or not we believe in these things, they have an effect on us. Ritual has an effect on us. Um, and I've seen for myself that people from lots of different parts of the region and people with very different beliefs in Dakar all take very seriously this idea that the people who have spiritual ownership to the land and ownership that has to be revived regularly through ritual are a force to be reckoned with. So I think there is a lot to be to learn from from these um, cultural practices collectively, and we shouldn't see them as specifically African or, or exotic, because actually, when we start thinking about it, we see very similar forms um, of spiritual ownership, even in European societies, but they're just not formulated in the same way. And then coming to um, Arati's uh, project and, and the conversation uh, with um, the participants from 
Kisumu, I, I was also completely blown away by this. I completely agree that too often in development policies, the voices of the people concerned, uh, the people most affected by the environmental crisis are unheard, or if they are, at best, they tend to be consulted as an afterthought to validate projects. Um, when projects have already been designed and funded, and there's something inherently colonial and wrong in this, which continues to plague the development industry. Um, I think universities need to advocate for a reversal, um, fundamental change in this process. So we as university people have a collective responsibility to advocate for the voices of the people most affected to be included in the very design of development projects. And that might also be where some of these practices I've mentioned before and which Sarah explained very well, can actually be included in the very design of development policies. Development should not be, uh, development and sustainability should not be looked at as a strictly technical issue as it too often is, because that is, as we know, a recipe for failure. Um, as Arati said, I really like this idea that um, the people like Azaya and, and the others present here, the real experts, um, and they are the real experts because they live with the worst consequences of, um, of, of climate change. They live with the, the worst consequences of what is essentially a global economic system that has generated the environmental crisis in the first place and which let's not forget started with colonialism and has continued in different forms since. We still live with the legacy of colonialism of an economic system which has actually created the problems in the first place. And I think Isaiah and Charlene made it very clear that environmental projects in communities like Kisumu can only ever be successful when they are developed with a really on the ground detailed knowledge of the local context, um, including a knowledge of the multiple obstacles that people face on the daily basis, what people can afford to do or not. And that is why they're the real experts. And that is why I think their voices should be uh, included in the very design of research projects. Arati, Bernard and Isaiah also mentioned the importance of bringing real stories uh, from people's lives to government officials uh, and to the wider public. And I really think the power of narrative is crucial here as we just discussed. And I think as um, Liz put very eloquently, it is precisely stories from people's lives that have the power to generate empathy. And we need empathy for people to act. Stories also have the power to demonstrate um, that as Bernard explained, climate change is a global issue. It's one that affects every one of us, as Liz also said, um, and it's not located in a particular part of the globe, although it's very clear that it does affect some more than others. So I think a key thing from these interventions from Kizumu is the power of stories which are told by the people concerned themselves. And I think Almaz also made this point very powerfully when she said that the climate emergency needs to be explained in the form of stories for people to be able to relate to them. She said that not everything has to be explained in scientific terms, even though science is the basis for the message. And I, I so agree with that. I think we need to hear this um, every single day. And then a final point from the Kisumu interventions is that small scale, I think they also show uh, very clearly that small scale initiatives like the waste management project should not be neglected as marginal. They shouldn't be regarded as too small to have an impact because it is at the local level that people need to experience for themselves that they have agency. And I think Almaz and Aria also made that point very powerfully. If people locally gain confidence that they can be agents of change, they will also have the confidence to become advocates. And governments everywhere are now realizing that they can no longer ignore youth advocacy. Um, big corporations and governments 
tend to want to ignore youth advocacy, but governments at least, I think, are beginning to realize that there is such a heavy political price to pay um, that they can no longer ignore those. So, and that's because the because of the the, the numbers, um, youth are the constituencies of the future and um, political elites are, are very aware of this. So that power needs to be used. And then finally, uh, the presentations by Almaz and, and Arya, I was, I was totally blown away by the work that you do, your eloquence. Um, and I, I completely agree that uh, no overdose of doom and gloom can be very disabling. Uh, Liz also made this point. Young people like you, I think, have a really crucial message to communicate to the world, because as the ambassador said at the beginning, the fight against the climate emergency really suffers from a deficit of imagination. And you've shown very powerfully that you have the tools to address this deficit and to inspire people elsewhere. And then on a more personal note, when you mentioned Alma Sarafina and um, Give Me Hope Joanna, it made me very emotional because as, as, a, as a teenager growing up between, uh, as a black woman between France and West Africa, I was really looking to the arts of apartheid South Africa to find my own place in the world, to find my own identity and to define myself. And these were some of the works that I took with me at the time. Um, so, so to hear uh, those, those uh, works um, of art mentioned uh, in this context really uh, completely blew me away. So really thank you for that. And, and I would agree almost that everybody should see um, Sarafina and actually look to protest theater from the apartheid period um, as, as a potential way of spreading the message. These are works that have endured um, and many more since then. So thank you all for these amazing interventions. And I think um, I'll hand back to Florian. I'm sure there'll be lots of other questions and comments. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Elaine. That, that was um, a wonderful way of really creating connections between the different uh, parts of our discussion today. And, and I couldn't have uh, expressed it nearly as well as you did, but, but many of the things that you mentioned were things which obviously were very much on, on my mind and on the mind of all the people who in different ways have contributed to this, to this opening session of our series today. So I'm, I'm personally very, very pleased and very grateful to you and to, to all the speakers. Um, I realize it's, um, it's, it's, it's relatively late on a Friday afternoon now for, for many of us, not so much for those in the UK perhaps, but certainly for those in continental Europe and, and even more in Kenya. So I would um, invite again members of the audience to, we've had a sort of steady flow of questions and comments, which is wonderful and, uh, and uh, have replied to this. Um, do send us any further comments and questions that you have. Um, if you would like to ask any questions in person, um, you're also very welcome to, uh, to, to, to let us know through the q and I think that's the best way and then we can um, promote you to panelists. Um, but while we do this, um, I would also like to ask um, Sarah and Almaz and Beth and Bernard and Asaya and Arya um, to make themselves visible for a moment, please, if you, if you can, if your connection allows for this, and thank you for, for staying with us throughout. And if there is anything that any of you would like to, to share at this point, maybe as a further thought or in response to, to, to what Liz and, and Elaine have said. There, I see there is a question um, which has been, I think, um, answered. It was just sort of a message from Susan Collins to, to thank us. Um, is there anything that you would like to, anything further that you would like to raise or, or share or, or comment before we, before we thank you all officially and, and disappear into our well-deserved Friday night? Uh, thanks so much, uh, Florian. Can I go on? Please, Bernard. 
Okay. Baba, punguza hii sauti. Okay, thank you so much uh, Florian. Uh, mine is to really um, I was very keen on the comments uh, from Liz and uh, Helen. And uh, first of all, I have to thank the two for the compliments on the project that we do in Kisumu. Uh, how I wish, I'm really not sure, but I know as we, before we close Florian, you may give us a way forward because um, as in Kisumu and Lekdora region, we, this region is highly impacted uh, by climate change, highly impacted by climate change, our farmers, our fishermen. So my comment is that I, I, I believe you will we'll have a way forward on this uh, so that we can focus. It, it, uh, I'm, I really wish that, uh, and I believe that we have picked on something so that we can have uh, an initiative on climate literacy uh, or climate advocacy as a project so that we can take it on the ground. Uh, that is what Ellen observed and that's what we have been doing here. So that, and also, I also had a comment from my two sister from South Africa. That's really very good that after we, as we speak scientific, let us make it simple, but not too simplistic that we lose the meaning, but we pass the information. Thank you so much. Thank you, Bernard. And we very much hope, of course, that your activity can continue and, um, and we would that we, we have done something today as well with this panel to, to, to share the work that you are doing in Kisumu uh, with, with audiences, not all of which have been aware of this. So um, again, thank you very much and best wishes. Uh, is there anybody else who would like to, to, to say something at this point? Okay, I think everybody seems um, uh, to have reached the point when we are we are taking well, you are all taking pride in the in the things that we have achieved together today, and we're not receiving any further questions. So I take this opportunity to thank you all very much again. It's been a real uh, honor and pleasure for me to listen to you today, and uh, thank you to those in the audience who stayed until the end of this long session. I hope that some of you can be with us again in a week's time. In the meantime, have a lovely evening. Thank you very much and goodbye everybody. <laughs>